Welcome back. In this video, we're going to talk about finite automata, which we'll see in future videos are a good implementation model for regular expressions. So in the last few videos, we've been talking about regular expressions, uh, which we use as the specification language for lexical analysis. And in this uh, video, we're going to start something new. Uh, we're going to talk about finite automata, which are the uh, are very convenient uh, as an implementation mechanism uh, for regular expressions. And so regular expressions and finite automata are very closely related. It turns out that they can specify uh, exactly the same languages called the regular languages. Uh, we won't prove that in this course, but we'll certainly make use of that fact. Uh, so moving right along, uh, what is a finite automaton? Well, here is a typical definition, as you might see it in an automata theory textbook. A uh, finite automaton consists of an input alphabet, so these are the set of characters that it can read. Um, uh, it has a finite set of states, should probably emphasize that. This is what makes it a finite automaton, that it has some set of states uh, that it can be in. One of those states is special and is designated as the start state. Uh, some subset of the states are accepting states, so these are the states that, um, that well, we'll just find them more in a minute, but intuitively, if the automaton uh, terminates uh, after reading some input in one of these states, then it accepts the input, otherwise it rejects the input. And finally, the automaton has some set of state transitions. That is, if it's in one state, it can read some input and go to another state. So let's uh, look at that in a little more detail. So a transition in a finite automaton, if I'm in, in this case, I've written out one particular transition here, if we're in state one uh, and we read the input A, then the automaton can move to state two. Okay, and there could be lots of different transitions for the automaton from different states and different inputs. And it's read in the following way. If we're in state one on input A, we will go to state two. And if the automaton ends uh, in an accepting state, when it gets to the end of the input, then it's going to do what's called accepting the string, meaning that it will say yes, that string was uh, in the language of this machine. So intuitively, the uh, automaton starts in the start state, and it repeatedly reads inputs, um, one input character at a time, makes a transition, so it'll see what kind of transition it can make out of its current state based on that input to another state. And if when it's done reading the input, uh, it's in one of the final states, uh, then it will accept. Otherwise, it's going to reject the input. Now, what are the situations in which it rejects? Well, if it terminates in a state S, that's not one of the final or accepting states. Okay, so if it ends in any other state besides one of the accepting states, then it's going to reject. Uh, if the machine gets stuck, meaning it finds itself in a state and there's no transition out of that state on the input. So in particular, let's say that it's in some state S and, there's, and the input is A and there's no transition. There's no transition specified for state S on input A. So the machine can't move anywhere and it gets stuck and that's also a rejecting state. Uh, and so in these two situations, if, uh, if either it gets to the end of the input and is not in a final state or if it never reaches the end of the input because it gets stuck, in both of those cases, it rejects the string. That string is not in the language of the finite automaton. Now, there's an alternative notation for finite automata that I think is more intuitive uh, for examples. And so we're going to emphasize uh, that way of writing them out. Um, in this notation, a state is represented as a node in a graph, which we just draw as a big circle. Uh, the start state is represented as a node that has an edge or an arrow into it uh, with no source. So this is a transition into the node, but no uh, source node that it comes from, and that indicates the unique start state. Uh, an accepting state is drawn as a node with just double circles like this. And finally, a transition is drawn as an edge between two nodes of the graph. So I, what this says is if I'm in, in this state that I'm circling in blue, and I read the input A, well then I can move to this state that, uh, at the tail of the arrow. So now let's do a simple example. Let's try to write out the automaton that accepts only the single digit one. So we'll need a start state, and we'll probably want 
an accepting state as well. And now the question is, uh, what do we put in between the two? Well, there'll be some kind of a transition here, and it's a good guess that we should take that transition if the machine reads a one. And now let me take a moment here to talk about how uh, the machines ex execute. So let's label these states. Let's call this state uh, A, and let's call this state B. Okay. So uh, the machine will have some input. Okay, and uh, we can write that input out over here. So let's just say we have the single character one, and it begins in some state, namely the start state. And so one configuration of the machine is the state it is in and the input. And typically we would indicate where it is in the input by a, just a pointer saying what position it is in the input. And uh, the important thing to know about uh, input in uh, for finite automata is that the input pointer always advances. So when we, or it only advances. So when we read a character of input, the input pointer moves to the right and it never moves back. All right, so from state A, uh, we have a rule. We can see that we're in state A. Uh, the next input character is a one and that allows us to take a transition to state B. And so now um, we're B in state B and where is our input pointer? Well, it's beyond the end of the input, indicating we are at the end of the input. And so now this is, uh, we are in an accepting state and we're past the end of the input and so we accept. Okay, so let's uh, do another execution. So we start in state A and uh, let's take as our input uh, the string zero. Okay, and I'd like to draw the pointer actually, I should have drawn it before the input. So we'll always put the pointer uh, between two input elements, in this case and it's immediately to the left of the one we're about to read. So in this case, we're about to read zero. So we're in state A, our input is zero. We look at our machine. Uh, we see that there is no transition on zero. All right, and so the uh, machine stays stuck. It doesn't make any move at all. And this is our uh, final configuration. And we can see that we're not at the end of the input. And, and, and so this is a reject. Okay, so in this case, the machine rejects that string as not being in the language of the machine. Uh, let's do one more example. Uh, let's say that we're in state, uh, well, we're always beginning in state A in the start state. And let's say our input this time is the string one zero. Okay, and our input pointer is there. All right. So uh, again, we're in state A, the input is a one, and so we'll move to state B. And now the input doesn't change, just the input pointer changes, but I'll just copy the input over to show um, the difference. So now the input pointer has advanced because we've read uh, one character of input, and now we're in another state. And now we can see uh, that we're in state B. Um, our next input is zero, and there is no transition uh, on zero from state B. And so even though we're in an accepting state, uh, B is a final state, is one of the accept states, uh, we haven't consumed the entire input. And so this, the machine also rejects this string. So this is also a reject. And in general, uh, we could talk about the language of a finite automata that is equal to um, the set of accepted strings. Okay, so the language of a finite automaton, when I talk about the language of a finite automaton, I mean the set of strings that the automaton accepts. So now let's do a more complex example. Let's try to write out an automaton that accepts any number of ones followed by a single zero. Uh, so once again, we'll need a start state and uh, we'll also need a final state. And now let's start by thinking about what the shortest string is that's in the language of this machine. So in this case, uh, we know it has to end in a single zero. So a zero definitely has to be, a zero transition has to be the last move. And before that zero can come any number of ones. And in particular, there could be no ones. So one uh, transition in this machine is that from the start state, uh, on input zero, we can definitely go to the final state because the single, the string consisting of a single zero is in the language of this machine. And now the only question is how do we 
encode the fact that any number of ones can precede this zero? Well, there's an easy way to do that. Uh, we can just add a self loop on the start state uh, and take that transition if we read a one. And what does this mean? This means that we'll stay in the start state as long as we're reading ones, and then as soon as we read a zero, we'll move to the final state because that has to be uh, the end of the string uh, um, if, this, if the machine is going to accept it. So now let's do a couple of examples to convince ourselves uh, that this works. Uh, let me label these states again. So this is state A and that's state B. So um, let's write out here state and input. So we'll begin in state A and let's take as input uh, 1, 1, 0. Okay, so let's do an accepting case first. All right, so our input pointer begins uh, to the left of the first character. So we're in state A, in the start state, uh, we're reading a 1, and that says we should take a transition that puts us back in state A. And so we advance the input pointer. Okay, now we've consumed the first one. And, and again, we're in state A, and the next input is a 1, so we'll make another transition uh, to state A. And the input pointer will advance. Okay, so now we're in state A, and the next input is a 0, and so we'll take the transition to B. And now we're in this configuration, so the input pointer has reached the end of the input. Uh, we're in an accepting state, and so the machine accepts. 110 is in the language of this machine. So now let's uh, do an example where we will reject the input. And what configuration do we begin in? And again, a configuration for a finite automaton. Uh, that just means a, you know, a point in the execution and it always consists of a state and a position uh, of the input pointer. So our initial state is A and now let's just choose uh, the string, oh I don't know, let's take one zero, zero. And let's confirm that this is not in the language of the machine. All right, so we begin in state A and our uh, input pointer is there. Now we read a one and uh, that means we'll, you know, so it's from state A, a uh, transition of one, we stay in state A and the input pointer advances. And now we see a zero, so from state A on input zero we make a transition to state B. And now the input pointer is here, so now um, uh, we're in state B and we have an input of zero, but there is no transition out of B on zero. There are no transitions out of B at all. And so the machine gets stuck. It can't get to the end of the input. And again, even though we're in an accepting state, we haven't uh, read the entire input yet. And so that means the machine will reject. And so 100 is not in the language of this machine. Up to this point, a finite automaton consumes a character of input every time it makes a move. So if it can make any move at all, the input pointer advances. Uh, now we're going to talk about a new kind of move, the epsilon move. And the idea behind epsilon moves is that the machine can make a state transition without uh, consuming input. So for example, uh, if I have my state and I'm in state A and my input And let's just say uh, that we have x1, x2, x3, and for some reason uh, we're about to read x2. Uh, when we make an epsilon move, uh, the machine changes state, but the input pointer stays in exactly the same place. So the new configuration of the machine would be that we're in state B, but our input pointer is still waiting to read x2. So you can think of an epsilon move as a kind of free move for the machine. Uh, it, can, it can move to a different state without consuming any input. And uh, just to be clear here, the machine does not have to make the epsilon move. It's a choice. So it can decide whether to make the epsilon move or not. Now epsilon moves are the first time we've mentioned the possibility that a finite automaton might have a choice in what moves it makes. And there's actually an important distinction between automata that have choices and those that don't. So deterministic finite automata have two properties. First of all, they have no epsilon moves, so they must always uh, consume input. And second, they only have one transition per input per state. What do I mean by that? That means that if I look at any state in a deterministic automaton, they can never have something like this where they have two possible moves for the same input. 
all the outgoing edges in a deterministic automaton must have different input labels. And then non-deterministic finite automaton are just those that are not deterministic. So in particular, uh, a non-deterministic automaton can have epsilon moves, so it can choose uh, to move to another state without consuming input. And they can also have multiple transitions for one input in a given state. So something like this is okay for a non-deterministic automaton. Now let me just point out that really uh, epsilon moves are enough uh, to create non-deterministic automata and that this second case where you have multiple transitions on the same input uh, can be simulated just by a slightly more complicated machine with epsilon moves. So for example, I can draw this machine in the following way. I can have, or I can simulate um, the machine that's circled there in the following way. I can have a state with two epsilon moves and then uh, each of those states has a move on A. So if I were to label these states 1, 2, and 3, then this would be the state that corresponds to 1, and this would be the state that corresponds to 2, and this would be, be the state that corresponds to 3. So any time that we have multiple moves out of a state on a single input, we could always replace that by a few more states with epsilon moves and have every state in the machine only have a single transition uh, for every possible input. So really the only fundamental difference between deterministic um, automata and non-deterministic automata is whether they have epsilon moves or not. A key property of a deterministic automaton is that it can only take one path through the state graph uh, per input. So this is per input. What do I mean by that? Well, the, the automaton always begins in the start state and let's take a very simple input string like ABC. And if we look at the sequence of states that the deterministic automaton will take um, for that input, this path through the state graph is completely determined by the input because, again, it has no choice. In a given state, there's only going to be one transition labeled A, and it's going to take you to a state that only has one transition labeled B, and that goes to another state that only has one transition labeled C. And so every input determines the path through the state graph that the automaton will take. And this is not true for non-deterministic automata. So it might be, for example, that uh, beginning in the start state and on input A, that there is some state I can go to uh, on that input A, but there may be another transition uh, labeled A that would take me to a different state. So the automaton might be able to go to one of two different states. And again, there might also be epsilon transitions. And so what happens with non-deterministic automata is that in general, as they proceed through the state graph, as they execute on the input, they could wind up in any number of different states. Okay? And the rule with a non-deterministic automaton um, about when it accepts is that it accepts if any path accepts. So an NFA accepts if some choices lead to an accepting state at the end of the input. That is, the non-deterministic automaton uh, can choose what move to make, and as long as there is some choice it could make, uh, that would get it to an accepting state. So let's say, uh, switching colors here, that you know, this was an accepting state down here, and it took this path then it would accept. And maybe all these other paths are rejecting paths. That doesn't matter. As long as there is one path, uh, one set of choices the NFA could make uh, to get it to an accepting state at the end of the input, then we say that that string is in the language of the NFA. The fact that NFAs can get into multiple different states depending on the choices they make uh, during a run uh, is important and will actually play a central role in a future video. So we're going to do a quick example here to just make sure that this is clear. Uh, so here's a uh, little automaton, and note that it is non-deterministic. From the start state, there are two possible moves on input zero. And what we're going to do is just walk through an execution of this machine uh, on a sample input and see what different states uh, it can get into. So we begin in the start state, and we should probably label our states, actually, so that we can refer to them. Let's call them A, B, and C. And let's say that the first input is 1. 
And so what does that uh, mean? That means we'll take uh, this transition, we'll just uh, go from the start state and come back to the start state. And so the set of states that the machine could be in after the first transition is just the set A. So it's guaranteed to still be in the start state. So there's no, no choices with the, uh, the first move. Now let's say that the second input character is a zero, and now we do have a choice. We could either go to state B or we could go to state A. And we could think of this then as a set of possibilities that after we execute uh, this move, this transition, the machine could be in any one of a set of states. And actually this completely characterizes the possibilities for the machine. We know we've read the second input character, and now we could be in a set of states. Okay, we could be either in state A or in state B. And so now let's say we read another zero. And where could we go then? Well, um, if we're in state B, we could make the transition to state C. But if we're in state A, then we'll make the transition uh, either to state B or again to state A. So in fact, we could be in any one of the three states if we read another zero. And now I think you can see uh, what the rule is. So at every step, um, a non-deterministic automaton is in a set of states of the machine. And when it reads another input, we consider all the possible moves it could make to compute the complete set of states it could be in at the next step of the machine. Okay? And then, the, then uh, finally, how does we decide whether the machine accepts? Well, we look at the final state. Uh, after the last bit of input is read, and if there's any, um, sorry, we look at the last set of states after the last input character is read, and if there's any final state in that set, then the machine accepts. And in this case, after we read zero, uh, we see that an accepting state C is in this set of possible um, states, and what that means is that there was some set of choices that the machine could make that would get it into a final state at the end of the input, and so the machine accepts this input. Okay, so if there is a final state in the final set of possible states, then the non-deterministic machine accepts. It turns out that NFAs and DFAs recognize exactly the same languages, in particular the regular languages. So NFAs, DFAs, and regular expressions all have equivalent power. They can only specify regular languages. Uh, DFAs are definitely faster to execute, uh, primarily or in, in entirely because there are no choices to consider. So a DFA can just uh, follow a single path uh, through the state graph, whereas with an NFA, uh, we have to keep track potentially of the set of choices in the NFA, and we might be in a set of states. Um, however, there are some advantages to NFAs. Uh, they uh, are, in general, much smaller than DFAs. In fact, uh, they can be exponentially smaller. So the smallest uh, NFA uh, may be much, much smaller uh, than the smallest equivalent uh, DFA for the same language. And there's, so essentially there's a space-time trade-off between NFAs and DFAs. Uh, NFAs might be more compact, uh, but DFAs uh, will be faster to execute. 